All right, it is 6.30. I'm going to call the meeting to order. Good evening, Democrats. How's everybody doing tonight? Hanging in there? <laughs> I know. Yeah. We're going to take a second and put some more tables and chairs over here. We got some other folks coming in. Thank you so much for giving us your time and energy tonight. We really appreciate it. And I know there's a lot of other things you could be doing. So uh, as of now, I will entertain a motion to approve the agenda. And a second. Jackson, was that a second? <laughs> you raised your hand right at the perfect time. It's motion and seconded to approve the agenda. All in favor? All in favor of approving the agenda? Thank you. The agenda is approved. Wonderful. All right. I'm so happy to see so many of us showing up tonight. We're going to start off with candidate comments, and that's non-agendized candidates. So if you're part of the endorsement consideration, that won't be you. Everybody else, any candidate for anything, any office, or anyone speaking for a candidate, come on up. All right. This, this might be a first. We got somebody on Zoom, Hannah. All right, well, we'll give that a minute and why we get these tables and chairs set up as well. I want you to uh, take a note on your agenda. There is a postcard action and there are postcards there for you. What we'd love for you to do during this meeting tonight is to write a couple of postcards. There are two addresses, one for the Sacramento office and one for the San Jose office. And this is to ban child marriage in California. So it's something very important that we've been working on. And Assembly Member Calra is holding up the works. So um, there's going to be an action outside of their office this week, and we want to have these postcards ready for them. So if you could all please write two postcards, one for Sacramento and one for San Jose. The uh, message that you'd want to write is also on your agenda. And that would be great. I'll collect the postcards at the end. I have stamps and we'll be all set and ready to go. Okay, have we got any candidates for candidate comments? Seeing none, we will move on to uh, elected officials and their representatives. Would you like to speak, Doug? Come on up, you gotta come on up. Otherwise the people on Zoom won't be able to hear you. That's a very important note. If you have something to say, you need to raise your hand so I can give you a mic so that everybody can hear. Okay, well, I'll be extremely brief. Uh, I'm Doug Case. I am the uh, political affairs director for uh, State Senate President Pro Tem uh, Tony Atkins. Uh, the legislature is uh, now in a summer recess. They come back in August and finish out their session. Mm -hmm. And then the uh, senator will be done with her term. And as you know, she's termed out of the uh, legislature at the end of the session, so at the end of uh, uh, end of November. Uh, but she's running for governor in 2026, and uh, so we're looking forward to the campaign. In terms of the uh, end of the legislative session, uh, I've talked for the previous meetings about the budget, and uh, you know the good news is that most of the things we are most concerned about in terms of cuts in the uh, governor's may revise in terms of the homeless funding in terms of transportation funding, uh, higher education funding, uh, child care, we're all be able to be restored. And so even though it was a very difficult uh, budget year and we had to dip into the reserves that have been built up over the years, uh, thanks to the responsible uh, budgeting of the Democrats, uh, we were able to get through it without making any uh, cuts to the most vulnerable. But the legislature, when they did finally adjourn, and they normally adjourn at the end of June, but they stayed until midnight on uh, July 3rd, and uh, they put on the on the ballot a uh, $10 billion education facilities for K-12 through bond, and also a $10 billion uh, climate bond. So look for those on your ballot in uh, November. So thank you. Thank you so much, Doug. And now we are so happy and so proud to have our wonderful Congresswoman, the Honorable Sarah Jacobs. Well, thank you, Kathy. Hi, everyone. It's so nice to be back here with you all. I was just reminiscing about all of the early days we spent here. 
Um, I can't believe that, that was um, almost six years ago. Um, but here we are still fighting the good fight. Uh, and I just wanted uh, to give you guys a quick update and then happy to take any questions. First, um, you know, I want to address the the shooting that happened at the Trump rally. Um, obviously, you know, I know that it rattled a lot of people. It rattled me. Um, you know, I think we all here know that, you know, part of living in a democracy is that though we have disagreements, though we have conflicts, we resolve those through the ballot box, through protests, through other nonviolent means, not through violence. Um, and, you know, one of the things I'm spending a lot of time thinking about, I know you guys all know my background's actually in international conflict resolution and peace building, um, is how we bring our country back together after this and after what will be a very contentious election and how we work together to build a, a better and brighter future. Uh, and that's really what this election is about, right? Building a better, brighter future together, um, because it's not just about who the president will be. It's not just about who is in Congress. Those things are very important. It's also what each of us individually can do in this moment to build that better, brighter future. But listen, I'm not going to sugarcoat it. We know what the Republicans want to do if they get into power. They've already told us, right? They want a federal abortion ban. That means even here in California, where we've passed a constitutional right to abortion, a federal abortion ban would supersede that. They are now going after IVF and birth control. I don't know how many of you guys have read Project 2025. Have you? Yeah, it's pretty scary. Um, some of the things they want to do. Uh, I'll just give you uh, a, a few of the ones that I found the most alarming. Uh, expands presidential power. No more checks and balances. Uh, re remakes the federal workforce so that we no longer have an apolitical civil service. Uh, restricts abortion and rescinds FDA approval of Mifepristone, eliminates the Department of Education and Head Start, which you guys know is like a passion of mine, um, slashes climate protection, slashes legal immigration. I mean, they're telling us what they want to do, and it's really bad. Uh, so, you know, what I'm trying to do right now is think about how we bring the country back together and stay focused on the stakes of this election make it about the policy differences we have, which we need to be talking about over and over again, and we can't shy away from, and make sure people understand what really is at stake here. So thank you all for everything you do. I know you guys are spending a lot of time talking to your friends and your neighbors and random people you meet on the street um, about the stakes of this election. Uh, and it's that's really what it's going to take. Um, so thank you and happy to take questions. Thanks. <laughs> Check one, two. The volume needs to come up a little one on this one, Joe. Okay. Uh, hi, Congress. Um, Ms. Jacob, Congress Jacob. I'm really having concerns because I read an article about Imtala and pretty much it's a federal state, um, federal. It's a federal mandate. law. Yeah. Um, and the fact that what the individual states are doing, that it will supersede. Where do we stand on that right now? Yeah, it's a good question. For those of you who don't know, EMTALA is a federal law that requires um, emergency medicine to be provided to anyone who is in serious need of it. Uh, so it's why uh, you can go into the emergency room and get the care you need without any questions asked, even if you don't have insurance, even if you don't have papers, all of that. Um, the, uh, state of Idaho, uh, has essentially a full abortion ban and, uh, a suit was brought against the state saying that that was, um, getting in the way of people's rights under EMTALA to have access to emergency abortion care when their life was at risk. Um, that went all the way up to the Supreme Court. What the Supreme Court said was that uh, they weren't going to rule on it right now, but they lifted, um, they went back down to what the lower court had said, kicked it back down to the lower court, but lifted the stay, which means that at the moment in Idaho, in theory, people have access to emergency abortion care if their life is in danger. Although we know that, you know, in a lot of cases, there's not even that care available, not 
because like there's the hospitals don't even have the ability to provide it anymore, right? Because a lot of the doctors are leaving the state who are certified in doing uh, emergency uh, abortion care. So that's where it stands right now. They've kicked it down to the lower court. My guess is that they're going to roll on it after the election um, in the next, in their next docket. Uh, you know, they're done with cases for now. Um, uh, so we'll, we'll have to see. Anybody else? Hi there. We're so proud of you. Uh, and we are strongly support supporting Biden to remain our nominee. And I'm wondering what's your position on any of that, if you care to comment. Nancy, always with the hard hitting questions. <laughs> um, so, you know, I'm listening to, to everyone. I think most of you have my cell phone number. Um, if you don't, I'm happy to give it to you. Um, getting a lot of phone calls from from folks about what they're thinking about this. Uh, I'm a member of House Democratic Leadership. So along with Hakeem and the rest of our leadership team, we've also been having those conversations internally within our caucus. Um, so, you know, I think that it's best to keep those conversations private and internal. Um, but the conversations are ongoing. And really what I think we need to be focused on in public is, you know, making sure people understand the stakes of the election. Mm -hmm. We have a question on Zoom. Margaret? Oh, yes. Thank you. <laughs> Sorry, this is my first time on Zoom. Uh, hi, Sarah Jacobs. Hi, everybody. Thank you, Sarah, for being here. Um, at our meeting and um, my question was, um, I think there's an upcoming meeting with Netanyahu in Congress. And I was wondering if you were planning on attending that, that meeting. Um, yeah, so on July 24th, um, Prime Minister Netanyahu has been invited by the Speaker of the House to address the joint session of Congress. It's a thing that many heads of state do um, We've had, you know, the Prime Minister of Japan. We had President uh, Zelensky from Ukraine. Um, this will be, I think, the third or fourth time Prime Minister Netanyahu will have uh, addressed the joint session of Congress. I do not plan on attending. Um, I've met with Netanyahu personally a number of times. Um, I don't feel like I need to um, give him that platform or let him use uh, my identity to justify the things that he's doing that even many Israelis don't agree with. So. Thank you for answering my question. Um, I Do you think that there will be, can I ask one more question? Sure, go ahead. Thanks. Do you think there will be any Congress person there to hold him accountable to negotiate release of hostages? Well, it's not, it's not really a dialogue. So the way it works is they come, they give a speech and they leave. So, um, you know, I think there, there are a number of my colleagues who are planning on attending. Um, I think there will be, um, you know, things that some people try and do. Um, obviously we know there are protests going on in Israel right now to try and get him to, to negotiate, uh, uh, and agree to, you know, a ceasefire and hostage deal. Um, so definitely that, that pressure is ongoing. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm. Hi, Sarah. Hi. It's Elise. You know that even though you're not my congressperson, that I, I am in my heart <laughs> and your heart. You are. You are. Uh, what do you think about AOC and her attempt to um, get rid of certain people in the Supreme Court? Is that something real or is that just something that we need to talk about? I think we've all seen the things coming out of this Supreme Court that the ethics issues and have been deeply concerned. Um, the Republican majority gets to decide what bills come up for a vote uh, in the House. So I don't think they'll be bringing that one up for a vote. Um, so I don't think that's something that's likely to happen this term. And then depending on the election, we'll see what happens next term. You know, to me, you guys know I'm 
very nerdy conflict resolution person. I spend a lot of time thinking about what we need to do to rebuild trust and faith in institutions, because that's such a core piece of conflict resiliency. Um, and we know that it, the trust in our institutions in the United States has really eroded, not, not just over the past eight years, but actually even before that. Um, and so, you know, I think a lot about how we can restore the American people's trust in the Supreme Court, which also means making sure we are enacting policies so that the Supreme Court is not continuing on this path of these ethics violations that, um, you know, feel, feel very corrupting and, and are seemingly very corrupting. Um, I think there's a number of options there uh, and, and we're looking at those, but again, we won't be able to do any of it if we don't have the majority. We have another Zoom question. David, go ahead. Yes, uh, thank you. Congressman Jacobs, very nice to see you here. I was wondering if you're familiar with HR 82, which abolishes the weapon GPO in, in uh, Social Security. And it's getting a lot of, it has a lot of support. We've been working on it for decades. Um, do you know anything about the progress or what could happen with the ab abolishing the weapon GPO? Yeah, so I'm a co-sponsor uh, of that bill. Um, uh, you know, the for those of you who don't know, the windfall elimination provision um, basically means that if you're a civil servant and you have a pension, um, a, a government pension from a state or local government, you're not eligible for Social Security. Um, so a lot of teach this impacts a lot of teachers, for instance. Um, we have not seen appetite by the Republican majority to bring it up for a vote. So I don't think it will be a this term thing. Truthfully, we're getting to the point where like, there's not going to be much that happens this term till the election. Uh, um, uh, but, you know, we're continuing to push. And and again, hopefully, depending on the outcome of the election, we'll be able to get it done next term. Okay. Thank you. Hello. <laughs> um, so. Um... How can you can you help us in our in our discussion and our on and our uh, persuasive things that we can say um, as to why um, people who support um, Gaza and Palestinians um, should vote for Biden? Um, this is in, this is really important with young people a lot of young people and I have one in my family. So that's why I'm asking for help. Yeah. Um, as you guys know, I'm one of the youngest members of Congress. I like to joke I'm the designated young person in most rooms. Um, and that includes uh, the presidential campaign has had me going out to, to campuses, college campuses and to meet with young people all across the country. Um, uh, so this is these are conversations I'm, I'm having all the time. Um, the way I talk about it, and frankly, the way I think about it is, honestly, first of all, if your loved one lives in California and they don't want to vote for the president, it's okay. If they live in Michigan, let's have a different conversation. But, you know, let's let's be clear about what what's needed to win a presidential election if we lose a few votes in California at the top, not in the congressionals, because those are really important here in California. But you know, I'm less worried about that. But I've been going to Michigan, to Nevada, to all these places to, to talk, New Hampshire, to talk to these young people. And this is what I say, look, I don't agree with President Biden on everything. There's a lot of things I don't agree with him on. Um, there are a lot of things I wish he had done differently when it came uh, to the conflict in Gaza and that, you know, I pushed him. <laughs> He's infinitely better than what Donald Trump will do. Donald Trump will give Bibi Netanyahu a green light to do anything he wants, a blank check. And I can tell you for certain, because I've been in many of these conversations, that things would be a lot worse in Gaza, in Gaza if not for President Biden, because he literally pushed Bibi Netanyahu to allow humanitarian aid in when Netanyahu didn't want to allow any humanitarian aid in. He, uh, you know, has been pushing for this ceasefire deal that hopefully we will get soon. Um, and so has he 
gone as far as I would like him to go? Or, you know, has he said in public many of the things I know he said in private to Netanyahu? No, but our choices are between two people and Netanyahu would like Donald Trump to be president because he knows that it will give him a free reign to do whatever he wants. Uh, and so that's, that's really the choice we have right now. All right. Anybody else? I would love to hear more about your period tracking app, uh, app yeah. legislation. Yeah. So um, I think many of you might have heard about it before, um, but I introduced a bill called the My Body, My Data Act, which is what it would do is protect all reproductive and sexual health data. Um, so if you're using a period tracking app, if you're searching in a web browser, your location data on your phone, anything like this um, would be protected by this legislation. And what it would say is that companies can only protect, only collect and retain what is strictly necessary to provide the service you're asking for them. So if you, for instance, are using a period tracking app, you, they can't also collect your location data because that's not actually needed to provide the service you're asking of them. They can collect your period information. That's what you're asking of them. Um, they cannot sell it or share it. Uh, and you can ask for it to be deleted at any time. Uh, and you have the right to sue if you believe your data is being misused. And this is really important because what we're seeing in this post-Roe era is that actually this kind of data is the one of the only tools that these prosecutors have to prosecute people who are seeking abortions and those trying to help them. And I know we have a couple lawyers in the room, so I will defer to their judgment on this. Um, but, you know, we're already seeing it, right? So a case in Nebraska where uh, a woman and her daughter were being charged with an abortion that was illegal under state law, they used private Facebook messages. Um, we're seeing um, a anti-abortion groups in Texas being able to buy data of anyone who's visited an abortion clinic or searched for information about an abortion so that they can then target them with crisis pregnancy, you know, misinformation. Um, uh, so, you know, if you think about, for instance, um, accessing mifepristone, um, you know, often people in these states are buying it online and then getting it shipped to them because that's the only way they can access it. Um, if you have some sort of complication and you show up uh, in an emergency room, one of the only ways they can tell if it's a naturally occurring uh, miscarriage or a medically induced uh, abortion is, you know, trying to access the data to see if you looked up mifepristone, if you looked up how to have an abortion, any of these things. And so um, this is really important as we work to codify the right to abortion uh, across the state. Um, we're having a big conversation in Congress right now uh, around data privacy. Um, uh, again, this is one of those things because it's about abortion rights, this Republican majority will not bring it up for a vote, but we're working really hard so that when we knock on wood, win the house in a few months with all of your guys's help um uh we'll have it ready to go uh and it'll be sort of one of the top burner issues great so what i'm hearing from you is that we have to win the house we have to win the house guys whatever you think about what's going on at the top of the ticket the house is the last firewall <laughs> I'm I'm sorry, but the answer to every question is we have to win the house. <laughs> Thank you guys so much for everything you do. And this is Jackson on my team and uh, my amazing interns. If you guys ever need anything, I, like I said, most of you have my cell phone number. So always feel free to reach out to me, but also feel free to reach out to the team too. Thank you. So what I'd like to do now is take a real short break. If anybody would like to come up and get a picture with the Congresswoman, we'll take about a 10 minute break to do that. So come on up. Okay, come on. They're coming. Oh, I got you, you're my good. So for you folks on Zoom, please bear with us. We're gonna take a 10 minute break so that we can get some photos with our Congresswoman.
that? How do you know that? Because I can smell it. Does that smell? Yeah. I think that's what that is. Stay in contact with your husband. Yeah. No, no, no. She was so much. She was so much more dynamic. Oh my God. Yeah, Bobby wants to rock on. I don't know. 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 I don't so, and she, I know she's probably been, I know, I have been called her to do it, now. Call her a fat fella, so I don't have a bad Okay. Oh, okay. Oh, Oh no, I think that I'm already sorry. Thank you. All right. Thank you so much, Congresswoman. We are so proud of you. We're so grateful to have you in Washington. Let's hear it one more time for Congresswoman Sarah Jacobs. Okay. Great. All right. We are moving on to our agenda. We are going on to our endorsement consideration. So I'm going to introduce our endorsement chair, Mandy Havlick. Yay, happy Monday, everyone. Thank you so much for being here tonight. So tonight we've got a very exciting endorsement um, consideration for the healthcare district of Grossmont, district number three. We've got two candidates here tonight. We've got nurse Brenda Miller here in person. And then we have um, Nadia Fajud, who's online via Zoom. And so those are our two candidates that will be um, introducing, they'll be introducing themselves to our club tonight. And then you all should have received a ballot. If you are a voting member of the Democratic Women's Club of San Diego, if you have not received that electronic ballot via email and not made your selection, please find John or Beatrice to let that be known so that you are part of the vote tonight because after they um, make their introductions and we have discussion, we're going to announce the results of that meeting. So um, some of you may be wondering, we've been going through candidates for local city offices, county, as well as our school boards. What is a health district? You know, I had to Google it myself and ask and find out. So healthcare districts are very special districts that are designed um, to promote and support the community's uh, based healthcare services for those residents. And so I've learned that these healthcare districts, there's about 78 here in the state of California, and each health district on average um, services about a half million people at times. So um, with that, I've, I've got a number in my head. And so with fairness, um, I'd like to have um, Brenda pick a number between one through 10. 
and then we'll have uh, Nadia and then whoever gets closest to the number will be the first one um, who can come up and speak. So Brenda, you pick three. Um, Nadia, can you pick a number from one through 10, please? I'll, I'll go with seven. All right. Well, the number was four. So Brenda, you are closer to that. You'll be our first um, candidate to come up and speak. So again, we'll have each candidate will have five minutes. Afterwards, we can have um, up to three, four and up to three against the endorsement of that candidate who will be able to speak. But during that time, we're going to ask that our candidates leave the room or their staff so that uh, we want to promote a safe and a uh, welcoming environment so that here um, during the endorsement process, we as Democrats can feel safe and not fear retribution for the comments that are made in this space. So I want to ask that no one be repeating and placing comments to individual people um, and please respect this space. So I ask that um, as the endorsement chair. So. Yes, and again, as they have to be voting members to vote. So again, if you're a voting member and you have not received your ballot and you believe that you are eligible to vote, please find Beatrice um, to remedy that if that's needed. In addition to that, do you need to be a paid member to speak for or against yes. or be part of that discussion? Oh, you do? Yes. Okay, so that's good to know. So voting thought. members will have received a ballot in their email because they've attended two meetings in the last 12 months. But members in good standing may speak for or against, for or against, no matter how many mem uh, meetings they've attended. Okay. Thank you for that clarification. All right. So with that, let's invite Brenda Miller up here. You've got five minutes. Okay. And then do you have a timer? Oh, thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Democratic Women's Club, very much for the um, <clears throat> opportunity to have this endorsement. Um, as you know, I'm Nurse Brenda uh, Miller. I'm a nursing instructor at Cal State San Marcos, teaching senior nursing students, and I'm a hospital supervisor. And um, I've been a registered nurse for over four decades. I completed my doctorate in nursing from the University of San Diego, and I'm a candidate for Grossmont Healthcare District Board of Directors. And just to add a little more about the Grossmont Healthcare District, it serves people living in urban areas such as El Cajon, Lemon Grove, La Mesa, and more. Its boundaries also extends for as far east um, for remote communities like Mountain Empire, Alpine, Pine Valley, and the tributal, tri, tri, tribal communities, sorry. Grossmont, what is sharp, Grossmont Hospital said readmission rates for patients from rural areas in San Diego County has increased nearly 8% over the past five years. Um, and that it, especially people that live 50 to 60 miles away from the nearest hospitals, People don't have transportation, even if they live in urban cities. So we um, also have to take into consideration that that's even a problem because there are some communities that they may have a doctor's appointment at four o'clock in the afternoon. They attend the appointment, but they have to take public transportation by the time they get home. There is a major concern about getting home safely from that, um, from the public transit. A trans public transit system and so they don't attend those appointments and when you call as you know um, to make an appointment with the doctor you just don't get the time that you would like okay so as a future board member for the Grossmont Health Care District one there are areas that um, one that I'd like to continue uh, with the programs and projects that Grossmont 
the healthcare district is currently doing. They've got grants and scholarship programs, such as the full grant that um, people can get 25,000, simplified grant for 25,000 or less, scholarship to sponsor, I don't have the time, okay, <laughs> to sponsor charitable events. The big one that I like, I'm partial to, is the scholarship health care, education, and training for the benefits of future generations, post-secondary students pursuing higher education and health care who currently lives, work, or have a previous grad or have previously graduated from a high school. Um, I particularly like they're looking at, you know, behavior health. They, they're looking at registered nurse candidates. They're looking at um, nurse practitioners, which is very vital right now, okay? Um, they also have a program called Rural Health Discharge Pilot Program, and it's an effort to um, reduce readmission rates at Sharp Grossmont Hospital, improving healthcare delivery in rural and underserved communities. And what that is about is that when a person lives in a rural community, nine times out of 10, they are going to try to treat themselves, say, such as congestive heart failure, and they don't do a good job. So when the ambulance service call, or is called, they're called the person's in a crisis. The ambulance transfers, transports the patient to the emergency room, but the emergency room can be very overwhelmed. And what happens? The ambulance has to sit what's called the bay in a holding pattern until they can assign the patient over to the emergency room. When the ED is or emergency room is impacted, those ambulance uh, transport ambulance could be in that bay for two, three plus hours. They're not out in the field taking care of other needed things. So um, this rural health discharge pilot plan to help reduce readmission by they go out to the home, a public health nurse, they um, send a firefighter that a paramedic out to the home and they're able to follow up and make sure now you're discharged. Are you following the discharge instructions? And I'm going to say really fast, my dissertation was on the implementation of the discharge instructions after an acute care uh, stay. And what was found was that people don't read their discharge instructions. And that I'll say thank you very much for letting me talk. Thank you. Thank you, Brenda. Thank you so much. Oh, I guess I'm Brenda Meller, Dr. Brenda Meller okay. for Grossmont Healthcare District. All right. Thank you so much. All right. Well, next we're on to Nadia Fajud. Again, thank you for being here. You'll have five minutes to tap the floor. Thank you so much. Thank you, Mandy. Good evening, members of the Democratic Women's Club. My name is Nadia Farjud, and I am a healthcare lawyer, a community advocate, and a new mom running for the Grossmont Healthcare District Zone 3. I wish I could be with you this evening, but a work meeting ran late, and I would not have been able to make it to Elijah's in time, so my apologies for that. The most important role of the Grossmont Healthcare District Board is to serve as the landlord of the Sharp Grossmont Hospital. So even though the word healthcare is in its name and community health initiatives and literacy is certainly part of its mandate, the Grossmont Healthcare District Board does not provide patient care and does not ha have any role in directing Sharp Healthcare, which runs the hospital. I am best equipped to protect East County's only hospital as a healthcare attorney who has advised hospitals across the state on, protection, on protecting patients with knowledge of legal compliance through this particular board. So why am I running? My mom grew up in rural Iowa where the closest hospital was miles and miles away. This is just like our rural East County communities. Think Ramona, Pine Valley, and I'm committed to improving access to care for all. My dad is an immigrant. This is also a story common to so many who live in East County. I know what it's like to go to the doctor with a grandparent who doesn't speak English 
but deserves care in a language that they understand. My son is eight months old now, and I'm very passionate about the next generation having world-class health services, including right here in East County. If elected, I'm committed to being a voice for young families and to bringing a fresh perspective as the youngest ever elected and the only young parent on the board. It is time for a change on this board. This is a priority seat for Democrats in East County because the district now has an 18% Democratic voter advantage, which is significant and, and a new development. We can win this, we should win this, and I've been putting in the work to win this so a Democrat is in this seat. I've raised more than $92,000 from more than 570 donors, a record for this seat. I'm honored to have earned the endorsements of many Democratic leaders that we know and trust, including Congresswoman Sarah Jacobs, whom we all had the pleasure of hearing from this evening, Senator Atkins, and Supervisor Montgomery Stepp, along with all three Democrats on the La Mesa City Council. I'm also grateful to have earned the endorsement of the East Area Caucus. I want to draw this club's attention also to another endorsement I received from the Democrats for Equality Club, which unanimously endorsed me. Every single member present for that endorsement meeting 100% endorsed me. Let me tell you why. That club's questionnaire asked candidates uh, if candidates opposed a parental, parental notification requirement for a minor to obtain an abortion. I was the only candidate to oppose parental notification for a minor to get an abortion. When asked by a club member if candidates support parental consent requirements for minors to receive an abortion for youth to, and for youth to receive gender affirming care, I was the only candidate to stand for trans affirming care and stand against parental, parental notification for youth who seek an abortion. I do not think there are two sides to this argument. I am adamantly pro-choice, adamantly pro-trans rights, rights, especially for our youth who are often among our most vulnerable and deserve our protection, love, and support. After hearing the two starkly different answers that impact women and the transgender community, I received a unanimous uh, endorsement from Democrats for Equality, and I hope to receive your endorsement this evening. I wanna end with this. I have devoted my life to uplifting the voices, values, and visions of women, and I will continue to be a champion for women in public office if elected and if I had the privilege to serve in this meaningful role. I am a county commissioner on the status of women and girls and helped craft one of the most progressive CDOT ordinances in the country. That stands for Convention on the Elimination of All Forms of Discrimination Against Women. You need a truck to carry it around. I personally helped plan and execute the first ever Know Your Rights Symposium. I've been a board member for California Women's List, as many in this club know, and partnered with the Democratic Women's Club to launch a first of its kind study on the harassment that women face in office, which has led to the introduction of a bill, which is making its way through the legislature right now that would allow candidates to use campaign funds for mental health care. And I'm unapologetically 100% pro-choice and the only candidate in this race who can say that. I would be honored to earn this club's meaningful endorsement to flip this seat from red to blue in East County. This endorsement would be so deeply meaningful to me. Thank you for your consideration. Thank you for that, um, Nadia. I really appreciate you both being here. It's such a privilege to um, watch fellow club members and uh, women just rise up to the, the call of leadership. So with that, um, we'd like to open up the floor for discussion. So in Zoom world, Nadia, we're going to put you in the waiting room again. Sure. Thank um, you. Are there any other staff members online with you? Nadia, are there any other staff members online with you that need to be placed in the waiting room with you during discussion time? No, no, All they're right. not. All right, thank you. We'll bring you thank back you. into the to the room once uh, we're done with the discussion. Thank you. Thank you. All right, and then Brenda, if you'd like to step outside or if you'd like to step into the restaurant and any paid staff that you have here with you um, would need to leave the room during the discussion time. Thank you. So again, we want to remind everyone that you have received an electronic ballot if you are a voting member of our club. Once you have submitted that ballot, 
it's done. So um, at this time, we want to remind you, if you have not submitted your ballot, to please do so at this time. Um, if is if there's anyone here who has uh, needs assistance with voting and needs to do that in person, please um, raise your hand and we can provide you with a paper ballot if needed. All right. So, John, do we need any time to tally or? Has everyone has everyone in the room or right. in their ballot? So and we can bring um, Nadia back. Oh. If you are a new member, if this is your first or second meeting, you will not have received a ballot. You need to have attended two meetings prior to this one. And Brenda, uh, we can bring Brenda and Nadia. Um, just be advised that discussion has closed and we're going to bring the candidates back into the room. Um, so you want me to go let her know she's so Thank you. Hi. Thank you so much, Mandy. I'm going to go ahead with the officer reports and um, business, and then we'll, as soon as John's done tabulating, we'll have you come back up and finish. All right, we're going to move on to the agenda. The next thing on the agenda is business. Any unfinished or any new business? I've already let everybody know that uh, part of our unfinished business is our work that we've been doing to ban child marriage. You have in front of you two postcards. And if you would please fill out two postcards, one to go into the Sacramento office and one going to the San Jose office to Assemblymember Calra, who is holding up the legislation that would ban child marriage. Um, we're going to have these postcards. Mandy's going to take them up to San Jose and mail them there for greater effect. And please take a moment. The messaging is written on the agenda. If you aren't sure what to write, of course you can write whatever you'd like, but the messaging is on the lower half of your agenda. So that is our um, unfinished business that I have. Anybody else have unfinished or new business today? A question from Doug. Are we going to be taking positions on the propositions? That's a good question. That would be up to the club to figure that out. If if anybody wants to take the lead on that, that would be great. Mandy's, Mandy's happy to do that. So what we'll do is uh, the endorsement committee will look at the propositions and decide which ones that we're going to take a position on. Thank you for bringing that up. To invite uh, the League of Women Voters, who does a really good job of explaining the pros and cons of initiatives prior to uh, the club voting on it. That's an excellent suggestion. All right. If there's no further new or unfinished business, I'm going to move on to officer reports. Oh, Nancy. Thank you. I hope this is an appropriate time to talk about the election that's coming up. And I'm sure all of us in the room are committed to anyone but Trump. What came to my attention the other day was that 85 million people who were eligible to vote in the 2020 presidential election did not vote. And we know that half of those were women. That's 500, 42,500,000 women who did not vote. If women do not vote in this election, there is absolutely... Uh, I don't know what the consequences are going to be, but we know it's going to be intolerable. And we must not let this happen. I, for the last 20 years, have been saying the women need to actually step up. We need to step up because we're being attacked. And when you're attacked, you need to step up and fight back. And if we don't do it in this election, ladies, it's not going to happen. So this is our time. And we need to reach out to every woman we know and get them registered to vote as a Democrat. And it doesn't it doesn't matter what they're doing, as what the can who the candidate is and how distracted we are about the wars and the other horrible things that are happening in our world. But this basic issue of our rights is on the table and it's going to go backward. 
I remember when I could not buy a house. I could not have a credit card. I could not get a job as a professional, as an architect or a dentist. That's minor compared to where we're going to be if we don't stand up now. The climate is an issue. Our rights are an issue. You have to get involved and do more than you ever did to get women to vote. Thank you. Well said, Nancy. So I have a question for Nancy. Nancy, didn't you run against um, Peter Navarra? Do you have any comments to make about his uh, le recent release from prison? Peter Navarro, at the time I ran against him, was a despicable human being. And he is a despicable human being to this day. And he is addressing the Republican convention as a despicable human being. But he is a minor player in the threat that we have moving against us, ladies. So let us not be distracted. Let us remember our cause. All right. I'm moving on to officer reports. I'm going to start with membership. Let's talk to Patricia. Right. Uh, we have 124 members right now. About half of those are voting members, um, most of whom are here. Uh, I wanted to point out also that we are looking at um, uh, nominating people for future offices uh, coming up. We'll vote on that offices for our club in uh, October. And if anyone is interested in a particular office, if you know of someone that you would like to have in a particular office, please let me know and we'll get started on nominating people. Yeah, so in October, we form a nominating committee for the officer elections, which are actually in February. That's fine. So last year, Pat was our nominating committee and she, no, you were. You were the nominating committee. <laughs> anyway, if you're interested in being on the nominating committee, that will happen in October. And then the officer elections will happen in February. Um, let's see. Let's go down our list. Where are all of our officers? Oh, there's treasurer. Okay, as of the end of June, we have about $4,200 in the bank. Thanks. Great. All right. Hannah, do you have a report? Susan. Um, I just want to say that with endorsements and with elections, that sometimes we're on opposite ends of uh, the candidate uh, fields, but we shouldn't let that divide us, actually, because uh, we'll live to fight another day over another issue and we'll be on the same side for the same candidate for for candidates at that point because we uh, there actually we've had uh, Kathy has been on one side of a candidate I've been on another and we didn't let that affect our relationship and so I just want everyone to understand that we may disagree about who we support but we're still fighting the same fight and i think it's fantastic and we should normalize having multiple wonderful women candidates as well yes um let's see do you have a report <laughs> uh, recently we did something i am the founder of the black and african women rise democratic club and recently we joined the democratic women's club to do something together uh, I'm, now I would like the Women's Club to join the Black and African Women Rise Club. We're going to be educating and informing the community on Republicans 2025. And so we would like for this club to join us and every other club to join us. We're going to try to have it at the Live Well Center in Southeastern San Diego. And we're going to get some people to come in and speak about it, who know about it, people that we love. There will be no our people there, 
no MAGA people. They're just us. That sounds wonderful. You'll have to keep us uh, informed on the plans. You have a report? Yeah, this is a little bit, little bit tangential, but uh, you'll see the significance in a second. So, actually, a couple of weeks ago, I was in New York talking to the United Nations on this. It's called ICPD30, so International Committee for Population and Development. It has a specific focus on uh, using technology to transform the lives of women and girls. What was interesting about that and, and the relevance to what the club is working on is that what the UN has identified is that the use of technology to um, discriminate against and to harass women is a global all-time high. What they've also found is that the strategy of using social media to harass women and minorities is incredibly effective in preventing women from running. And it's actually now emerging to be an emerging global threat to democracy. So I, 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 the reason I mention it is we should do something about this because it's not sufficient just to give women candidates you know, the ability to use mental health or you know, funds to protect mental health. It's being used as a, as a tactic to stop women running. That was one of the things that came out of the study by California Women's List that we talked about creating some sort of a rapid response team that when a woman candidate or a woman in politics in general is being harassed online, that we can have a group of us that are kind of watching the comments for them and debunking things or reporting them as need be so that the candidate doesn't have to be distracted by doing something like that. Um, we haven't gotten past the idea into the planning stages, but if anybody's interested in working on that, that's something that we've been talking about for a few months now. So I think that would be a, a good step in, in the right direction with that. Andrea, thank you for that. All right, are you all ready? People in suspense, right? <laughs> Save the best for last. Um, before we announce um, the results, I do wanna again thank you um, for anyone um, who filled out a postcard. Um, as Kathy stated, I'll be heading up to San Jose to uh, be part of a chain in. It's where survivors of child and forced marriage, we dress up in wedding dresses and we have chains and we basically create a visual uh, for people to um, help in our efforts to abolish child marriage. So I really wanna thank you for just creating a space. You know, before I shared my story, um, it took a lot of therapy and years of working through uh, the shame of that story, uh, thinking that it was a subset of a subset, but to be in a space that not only I can share that story, but to have people stand and advocate with me, it means a lot. Thank you. So with that, um, I'd like to uh, share the results of our endorsement meeting. I'm gonna thank both of the candidates, Nurse Brenda Miller, Nadia Fajud, for being here. Um, it's a privilege to hear um, what you have to say and just for showing up and running for office. We're very proud of you. So with that, what are our results, John? All right, we've got Nadia who received 16 votes and Brenda received 17 and we received one no endorsement vote. So in order for a candidate to receive our endorsement, they have to meet that 60% threshold. So neither candidate um, received our endorsement. But as we've said time and time again, these are both um, lovely candidates. I would be willing to entertain uh, motions on the floor for either of the candidates. Mary Susan. Um, I move that we find both of these candidates acceptable. Yeah. We have a second? Yeah. Doug, all right. All in favor? Say aye. Any opposed? Any abstentions? Motion passes. Thank you. Congratulations, ladies. You both received the acceptable rating from the Democratic Women's Club of San Diego. Thank you for being here. Congratulations. 
Thank you. Mandy, may I register just a quick comment on the endorsement process for the club to consider? Maybe this isn't the appropriate time, but I would be happy to raise it at another time. Uh, yes, I mean, if you would like to share now or, or shoot me an email. Yeah, yeah. Um, one, thi one thing um, just from a, a number of the clubs that I've been to so far and something I uplift for the club's consideration in my personal capacity as a member, uh, knowing that the club won't consider my race, but for future races, I think um, a, one of the values of a democratic club is having the opportunity to ask candidates questions about their campaign, about their motivations for running, all sorts of things. And so uh, for the club's future consideration for different candidates, I would encourage the club to consider an opportunity to at least ask some questions of the candidates so members can participate in the process and deliberate. Um, and the second comment I have about the endorsement process is I understand that the ballot was circulated to members of the club before they could hear, have the opportunity to hear from us tonight. And yeah. so that's another thing that I would submit for the for the club's consideration for future endorsements is to not allow the ballot to go live until the candidates have had an opportunity to speak. So those are just not not for my race at all, but for a future future race um, to the endorsements process, speaking as a member of the club, I think that those two pieces, allowing uh, the, the membership to ask questions of the candidates being considered for an endorsement consideration, and the second is making sure the ballot doesn't go live until the club has had the opportunity to hear from the, can the candidates. And I'm sure this has been discussed in other meetings as well, but I just um, just uh, submit that for the group's consideration for future endorsements. Thank you so much for that feedback. I appreciate those comments. Thank you. All right. I would like to thank the endorsement committee for their incredibly hard work and the wonderful job yeah. they've done. Yes. And and it takes a village, the entire e-board, John, Beatrice, Pat, Hannah, you know, Kathy, Susan, everyone has been just it's been great working with ladies it feels great to work with people and just feel encouraged when you're like-minded and so i'm having a lot of fun um getting to know you all great thank you so much mandy great and now i got my glasses on so i can actually see so that's helpful um, okay, I think I've hit all of the officers except for me. So president's report. Um, I wanted to let folks know that we have a, the Dem Club Summit coming up, and that's going to be on August 3rd at City College from 10 a.m. to 5. And we have um, Tony Atkins is going to be there. Betty Yee is going to be there. And it's a wonderful event. This is the second annual and the first, I think it is first 200 people who sign up get a free lunch and there's a free breakfast too, if you come early enough. So they have panels, they have um, tables uh, where you can get information and it's a wonderful event. I will share all the details in the follow-up email that we've got. And um, one of the things they're asking for us is our support monetarily for the event. Last year, we gave $250 as a sponsor of the event, and I will entertain a motion at this time to do the same. So, all right, it's been moved and seconded that we sponsor the Dem Club Summit as a good amount of $250. Uh, it was Nancy, Nancy Cassidy. All right, all in favor? Any opposed? All right. We will be giving $250 to the Dim Club for the Dim Club Summit. Kathy, does that give us a table? Because we need volunteers for that table. So you all voted for this just now. And Kathy and I and John are a little tired of being the only ones. So we would like to have um, people there. Yeah, it's fun. You can answer questions and uh, we make friendship bracelets and it's a good time. Yes, yes. So you can do that. I also um, wanted to thank my tech team, John and Hannah over here. It, this whole thing falls apart without the two of you, as we saw last time. So thank you so very much for that. Um, let's see. I guess that takes us to announcements. If anybody has announcements, come on up. Jackson. Hello. Um, 
we are walking in the pride parade which i'm really excited about uh i just approved the d- design for the shirts we're getting special pride shirts made that are like amazing uh and uh all of you uh members of the club are welcome if you would like to walk in the club um with sarah and i um then uh just let me know i'm gonna make sure my email is like available so we'd love to see you guys yeah yeah, I mean, I'm going to I'm gonna have them in a big box at the morning of the parade, and then you can have one if you would like it. Yep. Ooh, I like that. I, yeah. <laughs> I think you can wear whatever pride shirt you want to wear. Is that correct? And I will include all of Jackson's information in our follow-up email. Do you have a starting time yet? Uh, yeah, we're going to be, we're going to want to get there at 930 and I, I know it kind of stinks, but I highly encourage you to not drive and take like an Uber or something because parking is going to be a nightmare there for everybody. Like I'm going to take an Uber for sure. It's on Saturday, July 20th. Yeah. And we would be wanting to get to our meeting space. I'm going to be there much earlier, but for you guys would be 930. And so if you, if you want to come send me an email so I can put you on my list of folks, I make sure I have enough, enough stuff for everybody. Right. And the club is not marching this year as a club. So if you're looking for a group to march with, Sarah Jacobs is a great option for you. So I will include all of that along in our follow-up email. Does anybody else have an announcement? Oh, we have somebody. All right. Angela. Hello there. And as part of our board. So this is technically a, an officer report slash announcement. Well, yes, because I am in the communication seat. So uh, my announcement tonight is that I am starting back my radio show, Woman of Color Roar Radio Show, which is the show that talks about things that matter, people, politics, and policy. So, you know, it's the only show that it turns out <laughs> that it's our local show where where um, I have people come on and we can talk about all the issues we care about here in San Diego. And so um, I was asked many, many times. Um, so I finally said, yes, I would come back and do the show. And there's so much going on right now that we need to have some in-depth conversations about. So I'm starting going to be starting the show back. And um, I just want to invite if anyone might be interested in working on the show as a producer, um, you know, it's just one hour a week and I'm going back into the studio and I'll be doing the show from the studio. So you can reach out to me if you're interested in, you know, learning production and working on the show, but mainly we'll be booking guests that are from the political area and community so that we can have the conversations we need to get to have. All right. Do you have the time and date for anything yet? Yeah, well, it's it's Saturday mornings at 10 a.m. And I'm going to be uh, taping the show. Um, so I'll be probably taping it Monday afternoons. All right. And do you start back up this Saturday? Uh, actually, I start uh, taping uh, next Monday. And so the first show will run uh, the last um, Saturday of uh, the month will be mm-hmm. the first the first new new shows. It's been running our in, uh, you know, in repeats. But mm-hmm. brand the first brand new show is going to be the end of the month. So so I'm going to start taping on the 22nd, Monday, the 22nd in the afternoon will be the first time we'll be taping again. Yeah. And then tune into the show on the 27th. And I'll also include that information. The name of the station. It's KNSJ. So mm-hmm. it's um 89.1 FM. So it's, you know, social justice radio and it's a nonprofit radio station. So I'm not bound to any, anyone with what I said, talk about. And we will include that in our minutes. So that will go out in the email for you as Thank well. You. So you don't have to remember it. Hi, um, my name is Lauren and I'm making an announcement for my future assembly member, Dr. Darshana Patel. She just opened a new office in Carmel Mountain Ranch. I was actually there um, before I came down to this meeting, and she wanted me to announce to you all that there will be activities out of that office starting once we get started. But on Thursday, Assembly Speaker Rivas is coming down to San Diego to do a fundraiser for her, and we would love to see you there. The information is on the website, and I can pass it to you if you want to pass it along to the club in an email. 
Yes, Darshana is a club member and an endorsed candidate, so we're happy to help that. All right. Hi again. For those of you who would like to direct uh, to take direct action on the climate crisis, every Saturday after, uh, morning at 1030, we have a group at the Ocean Beach People's Post Office, and we write letters to President Biden asking him to declare a national emergency to address the climate situation. So if you're interested, between 1030 and 12, come down and write a letter. We'll put the stamp on which by the way, if you haven't heard, stamps are now 73 cents. Seems like incredible. I know the post office people need it, but anyway, climate action is effective. It does get to the president uh, if we write enough letters. Thank you. Postcard stamps, stamps are cheaper and we are providing those for your postcards. All right. I'm The postcards, they're going to assembly member Paula. Oh, Mandy is taking them to San Jose. Yeah. And if you haven't written yours, please take a moment to do that. And I don't see any more announcements. Oh, we do have another one. On oh. Is that what? Yes. Just to say, yeah, Jackson earlier mentioned that, yeah, going to Pride is a really good idea to take... Uh, some ride lift service and he mentioned something that nobody in their right mind should ever use <laughs> but really what people should use is ride united right it's it's a it's a union uh all the all the workers for united taxi workers of san diego it's an app you can get on your phone it works just like uber so you can get it from the play store or the app store but the big difference is most of the money will go to the drivers and not to some executives in some faraway place in Uberland. Yeah, so ride, look for Ride United in right. your app store. And I will put this in the newsletter as well. And please spread the word. Yeah, thank you. Jackson is downloading it right now. <laughs> All right, while we're talking about apps, the club does have an app a mobile app that's free. You can search for it on your uh, for your Apple phone or for your Android. Search DWC-SD and download our free mobile app wherever you get apps so you can see all of our minutes, our uh, announcements, everything. There you go. And there we were at Pride last year. All right, seeing no more announcements, I am going to call the meeting adjourned. And thank you very much for coming, everyone. Enjoy the rest of your evening. <laughs>